Hey guys, let me see. This is my first time going live, so please excuse me for not being 100% prepared. Uh, what is this button? Oh, it's for sharing. Okay, I'm going to put this link in the group me just in case anyone needed it. All right, now that that's taken care of. I'm going to turn on the lights because it got dark. Okay, hold on. Can you turn off the light? I did. Sorry, guys. I'm also going to close these doors. I have big French doors to the office right here, and they're great for during the day because I get all this light streaming in. The disadvantage is that when my kids are awake, they come and see mommy. So I have to close the curtains and hide, essentially. <laughs> okay, so, all right, so the first thing that we're gonna do is set up for our note taking, right? Okay, so I've got my Word document open. I'm gonna type chapter six, attitudes. Attitudes. And then I'm going to type the next heading, which is the study of attitudes. And then I'm going to make the subheadings how attitudes are measured. How attitudes are section persuasion by communication and its subset sections two routes routes and then where you're from in the country, the source. Message. The audience. Culture. And persuasion. This whole typing thing may not work for a video link. Just realize that. We'll see. Maybe watch this. If it's insufferable, we will figure out a way around this. All right, so the third header is persuasion by our own actions. playing. I wonder why they made it too 
different words when playing as a word. So then clearly it doesn't play DMV. This means three. The classic version. Oh man, that makes me want to play video games. Cognitive. Why is that not? Underlined. Okay. And new look. Primitive routes. Oops. To self. Ethical dissonance, cultural influences. This would probably be a lot easier to type if the laptop was down on the table, but I've got it up here so that I can just pour it off of it. And I don't think that was a good idea. I think that's also going to change for next time. And then the last two main headers. Changing attitudes. I like when you do that and review. Okay. I wish I could show you guys my screen. That's another problem with recording straight off of the laptop. Okay, so I essentially have a Word document already primed and ready to go so that when I am taking notes, the headers are already there. I just have to start adding bullet points as I go. All right. Whoever's ready, woo. And I've got the chat open, so if anybody has any questions while we go through, feel free. Oh God, chapter six doesn't start off softly at all. Trump, climate change, abortion, <laughs> the death penalty, gun control, Israelis and Palestinians, immigration, health care, or health insurance. Anyone who has followed recent events in the world knows how passionately people feel about the issues of the day. Attitudes and the mechanisms of attitude change or persuasion are a vital part of human life. This chapter addresses three sets of questions. What is an attitude? How can it be measured? And what is its linked behavior? What kinds of persuasive messages lead people to change their attitudes? And why do we often change our attitudes as a result of our own actions? Okay, I think that's critical. All right, I'm gonna highlight those questions. and put that in my notes. So, for the subheading, I'm going to add some bullet points and say this chapter addresses three sets of questions. Nicole, what is an attitude? How can it be measured? What is its link to behavior? 
And then more kinds. Persuasive messages lead people to change their attitudes. And finally, why do we often change our attitudes? As a result of our actions. Okay. Oh no, I made this secret. Okay. There we go. All right, so now we're going to start the subsection, the study of attitudes. Are you a Democrat, Republican, or independent? Are you a city person, or would you rather live in a country setting? Should marijuana be legalized? Would you rather listen to alternative rock, country, or hip hop? Do you prefer drinking Coke or Pepsi, water or fruit juice? Do you have an iPhone or an Android? Like I said, introduction paragraph. We don't need to highlight anything. As these questions suggest, each of us have positive, negative reactions to various persons, objects, and ideas. These reactions are called attitudes. Ooh. Ooh. I'm gonna highlight it. I don't even have to wait. Key term. Skim the chapters in this book and you'll see just how pervasive attitudes are. You'll see, for example, that self-esteem is an attitude we hold about ourselves, that attraction is a positive attitude toward another person, and that prejudice is a negative attitude often directed against certain groups. Indeed, the study of attitudes is central to the whole field of social psychology. Ooh, that's another highlight. The study of attitudes is central to the whole field of psychology. I think that's really the only other thing that we need to highlight in that paragraph. An attitude is a positive, negative, or mixed evaluation of an object that is expressed at some level of intensity. Nothing more, nothing less. Like, love, dislike, hate, admire, and detest are all kind, kinds of words that people use to describe their attitudes. It's important to realize that attitudes cannot simply be represented along a single continuum, ranging from wholly positive wholly negative. As you might expect, if attitudes were like the volume button on a remote control unit or the lever on a thermostat that raises or lowers the temperature, rather, as depicted in figure 6-1, our attitudes can vary in strength along positive and negative dimensions. In other words, we can react to something with positive effect, negative effect, ambivalence, mixed emotions, or apathy and indifference, at times, people have both positive and negative reactions to the same attitude object without feeling conflict because they're conscious of one reaction, but not the other. Someone who is outwardly welcoming of racial minorities but harbors unconscious pre prejudice is a case in point. Ooh, okay, so there's a lot that I like about this paragraph. It's meaty. Um, so finding what is the most critical aspect of this paragraph is going to be hard. I think the first sentence, attitude is a positive, negative, or mixed evaluation is pretty key. But then later after the figure, I don't know which one's more important. Our attitudes can vary in strength along positive and negative, or we can react to something with positive, negative, and ambivalence or indifference. Hmm. 
I think I'm going to go with our attitudes can vary right after they say about the depicted in figure 6.1. Our attitudes can vary in strength along both positive and negative dimensions. I think that implies that it's it can be both at the same time. All right, next paragraph. Each and every one of us routinely forms positive and negative evaluations of the people, places, objects, and ideas we encounter. We like some things, but not others. This attitude formation process is often quick, automatic, and implicit, much of a reflex action. Okay, that's another meaty one. I'm going to highlight the first sentence and just that part that says, it's often quick, automatic, and implicit. Okay, you might assume that a person's attitude represents a unique relationship, a unique relation between that person and a specific attitude object. In two ways, however, our attitudes reveal a lot about us as individuals. First, people differ in terms of their tendency, in general, to like or dislike things. Consider an array of very different and unrelated attitude objects. How do you feel about bicycles? What about crossword puzzles, camping, Japan, Netflix, science, and religion? Curious as to whether people have tendencies in general to like or dislike things, which they call dispositional attitudes. Justin Hepler and Dolores Albarak-Singh, Al I do not know how to say that last name, in 2013 found that when they asked research participants to rate how much they liked or disliked a long list of unrelated things, some individuals on average tended to report positive attitudes and others on average were negative. I don't think that study is too important, but I do like that first sentence You'll notice that a lot. I either like the first sentence or the second sentence or the last sentence or the second to last sentence because usually the, the purpose of that paragraph or the point of that paragraph is stated at the beginning and then they're given, they, they explain that statement or vice versa. They'll start with leading you into what they're trying to say and end it with what they're trying to say. Yeah, I'm going to highlight our attitudes reveal a lot about us as individuals. And then I'm going to highlight first people different in terms of their tendency in general to like or dislike things. And that's going to lead us into the second one where they actually talk about the other thing. A second way in which our attitudes reveal something about us as individuals is that people differ not only in terms of whether they tend to like or dislike things, but also in the extent to which how quickly or how strongly they react. Think about yourself. Do you form opinions easily? Easily. Do you have strong li likes and dislikes? Or do you tend to react in a more guarded, less effusive way. Individuals who describe themselves as high rather than low in the need for evaluation are more likely to view their daily experiences in highly judgmental terms and are more opinionated, positive and negative, on a whole range of issues. I like that. I don't know which one's more important, that first really long sentence or that point right there. I think it's more general and more encompassing. I think the second one is a better example of just one side of that coin, whereas the first sentence encompasses everything. 
People differ, not only in terms of whether they tend to like or dislike, but how quickly and how strongly they react. Okay, so before we examine the elusive science of attitude measurement, let's stop for a moment and ponder this question. Why do human beings form and have attitudes? Does forming a positive or negative judgment of people, objects, and ideas serve any useful purpose? Over the years, researchers have found that attitudes serve important functions, such as enabling us to judge quickly and without much thought whether something we first encounter is good or bad, helpful or harmful, and to be sought or avoided. The downside is that having pre-existing attitudes can lead us to be closed-minded, biased, how we interpret new information, and make us more resistant to change. For example, Russell, Russell Fazio and others in 2000 found that people who were focused on their positive or negative attitudes towards computerized faces compared to those who were not, were later slower to notice when the faces were morphed and no longer the same. Interesting. So it makes you less observant. Yeah. I'm going to highlight two right in the middle, right in the meat. Over the years, researchers have found attitude, okay, I'm gonna highlight. Attitudes serve important functions such as enabling us to quickly judge without much thought whether something we first encounter is that whole spiel. And then I'm also gonna highlight the downside is having pre-existing. All the way to and make us more resistant to change. Yeah. All right, now that we're finished with the first chunk of the study of attitudes, I'm going to add my notes in here. Okay. So, which of us? Positive and negative reactions. Various persons, objects, and ideas. Why did I write that like it's a sentence? Okay, bold the key term, attitude. More Michelle, it's like you're trying to make this harder. And the sentence said positive and negative, but the Definition says positive, negative, or mixed reactions. Hmm. Okay. All right. See why? Look at the key. All right. So we wrote attitudes, and then we're going to write our next. Key, no, I don't need that folded. All right. Study of attitudes. Oh my gosh, I just realized I have a keyboard. I don't need to be clacking right next to the screen. What's wrong with me, guys? It's like I'm trying to make this difficult for myself. Cheese and crackers. This is taking me way longer. It always takes longer when you have to do it in front of somebody. Why? 
I just realized I've been doing this for almost 30 minutes. Okay. All right, the study of attitudes is central to the whole field of social psychology and an attitude is a positive, negative, mixed. You don't have to write that. That's the definition of attitude. We just typed that. Mmm. Self-editing. Attitudes are expressed at some level of intensity. Or I could just say expressed. And I will put that as a sub bullet of the definition because that's what it is. All right. I'm also going to make the next point a sub bullet. Vary in strings along both positive and negative dimensions. Each I'm just going to say all. All of us routinely um, positive and negative evaluations of the people, places, objects. Why didn't they just say nouns and ideas <laughs> we encounter? Formation process is often. I'm going to make these sub bullet points thick, automatic, and automatic, and implicit. Okay. I moved my bag. I don't need you anyway. Okay. All right, the next point. All right. Reveal a lot about us as individuals. I'm going to make these sub bullet points since there's two of them. All right. People differ in terms of their tendency in general to like or dislike things. And then, second way. People differ not only in terms of whether they tend to 
differ. I'm just rewriting everything. Why? Differ in the extent to which how um, quickly and how strongly they react. Really liked what they said about individuals after that, though. I'm gonna make that a sub point. I'll do that later. But yes, okay, so another bullet point about the study of attitudes. They serve important functions. Sub bullet is that it enables us to judge quickly and without much thought. Something the first encounter is sub bullet point good slash bad helpful slash hurtful. Not or avoided. And downside. Having pre existing attitudes and lead us to be. Closed minded. The downside is that having pre existing attitudes can lead us to be closed minded. Oh. Okay, so that's going to be part of downside. Lead us to all right. Close minded. This how we interpret new information and make us more resistant to change. Okay. All right. So that's the study of attitudes. Sorry, didn't mean to shake the thing. I just hit the leg. Okay, so now we're going to go to how attitudes are measured. Okay, put my keyboard away. All right. In 1928, Louis Thurston published an article titled Attitudes Can Be Measured. What Thurston failed to fully anticipate, however, is that attitude measurement is tricky business. At one point, several years ago, over 500 different methods were available to determine an individual's attitudes. Okay, self-report measures. Ooh, that's a subsection. 
How am I going to define that? Yeah, that's just okay. Okay. Let's go to the next paragraph. The easiest way to assess a person's attitude about something is to ask. All over the world, public opinions are reported on a range of issues in politics, the economy, healthcare, foreign affairs, science and technology, sports, entertainment, religion, and lifestyles. Simply by asking people, public opinion surveys conducted by Harris, Gallup, Routers, and the Pew Research Center and other polling organizations have revealed that about 82% of Americans believe social media waste, that Americans believe social media waste time, okay? And 72% believe that childhood vaccinations should be mandatory. 70% do not feel engaged or inspired at their jobs and 50% are not ready to trust a self-driving car. <laughs> okay then, still other surveys have shown that Americans prefer to watch football over baseball and chocolate ice cream over vanilla. Four out of every 10 American adults have a tattoo and Christmas is America's favorite holiday followed by Thanksgiving and the 4th of July. Oh, why do I have a feeling he's going to take something from that? I think I'm going to put a bracket on that paragraph in case I need to find any of that stuff easily. I know that it's got all sorts of little statistics in it. Yeah, I have a feeling that paragraph. All right. Self-report measures are direct and straightforward, but attitudes are sometimes too complex to be measured by a single question. As you may recall from chapter two, one problem recognized by public opinion pollsters is that responses to attitude questions can be influenced by their wording, the order and context in which they're asked, and other extraneous factors. That's a good point. In one survey, the National Opinion Research Center asked hundreds of Americans in the U.S. government if the U.S. government spent too little money on assistance to the poor, and 65% said yes. Yet, when the same question was asked using the word welfare instead, only 20% said the government spent too little. In a second survey, researchers asked more than 2,000 registered voters about their belief in the phenomenon of global warming, or climate change. Democrats uniformly endorsed the proposition at a high rate, but the number of Republicans who did so increased from 44% when asked about global warming to 60% when asked about climate change. Okay, that, that's a good paragraph. I think the first two sentences are the most critical Self-report measures are direct and straightforward, but attitudes are sometimes too complex to be measured by a single question. That chapter also has a whole bunch of little bits of information that might get pulled from, but not enough to type out. Recognizing the shortcomings of a single question of single question measures, survey researchers have developed more sophisticated methods. Often single questions are replaced by multiple item questionnaires known as attitude scales. Mm -mm -mm. That is a key word. Okay. All right, 
They come in different forms. I'm gonna highlight that part. Sorry, I know that we're at the beginning of the sentence, but I always jump in when there's a keyword. Perhaps mo the most popular being the Likert scale, named after its inventor, Rensis Likert in 1932. In this technique, respondents are presented with a list of statements about an attitude object and are asked to indicate on a multiple point scale how strongly they agree or disagree with each statement. Each respondent's total attitude score is derived by summing responses to all the items. However, regardless of whether attitudes are measured by one question or a full-blown scale, the results should be taken with caution. All self-report measures assume that people honestly express their true opinions. Sometimes this assumption is reasonable and correct, reasonable and correct, but often it is not. Wanting to make a good impression, people are often reluctant to admit to their failures, vices, unpopular opinions, and prejudices. I think that's the most important. Regardless of whether attitudes are measured by one question or a full-blown scale, results should be taken with caution. Sometimes, this assumption is reasonable and correct. The whole bottom is so meaty. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's meaty. I highlighted almost everything after however. <laughs> okay, so. Sometimes you have that, that's okay. One approach to this problem is to increase the accuracy of self-report measures. To get respondents to answer attitude questions more truthfully, researchers have sometimes used the bogus pipeline. Another. It is an elaborate mechanical device that supposedly records our true feelings physiologically, like a lie detector test. Not wanting to get caught in a lie, respondents tend to answer attitude questions more honestly and with less positive spin when they think that any deception would be exposed by the bogus pipeline. In one study, people were more likely to admit to drinking too much, using cocaine, having frequent oral sex, not and not exercising enough when the bogus pipeline was used than when it was not. In another study, adolescents were more likely to admit to smoking when the bogus bogus pipeline was used than when it was not. Okay, so they've got two, three studies in this one. Interesting. I think the only thing I'm going to highlight there is that it's an approach to increase accuracy. Okay, the next subsection is called covert measures. A second general approach to the self-report problem is to collect indirect covert measures of attitudes that cannot be controlled. One possibility in this regard is to use observable behavior such as facial expressions, tone of voice, and body language. In one study, Gary Wells and Richard Petty in 1980 secretly videotaped college students as they listened to a speech and noticed that when the speaker took a position that the students agreed with, the tuition costs should be lowered. Most made vertical head movements, but when the speaker took a contrary position that the tuition costs should be raised, head movements were in a horizontal direction. Without realizing it, the students had signaled their attitudes by either nodding or shaking their heads slightly or not. That's interesting. Okay, so. I'm going to highlight that first sentence, second general approach. And then such as facial expressions, tone of voice and body language. All right, that's a good study too. I'm gonna to put the little, I, I usually make that little symbol. I don't know what it's called. I'm 
it's a little squiggly line. <laughs> I usually make that line when I see a study that might be critical for the thing, or later when he's mentioned a study in class. I'll make that little note. Okay. Although behavior provides clues, it is far from perfect as a measure of attitudes. Sometimes we nod our heads because we agree. At other times, we nod to be polite. I don't do that at all. The problem is that people monitor their overt behavior just as they monitor self-reports. But what about internal physiological reactions that are difficult, if not impossible, to control? Does the body betray how we feel? In the past, researchers tried to divine attitudes from involuntary physical reactions, such as perspiration, heart rate, pupil dilation. The result, however, was always the same. Measures of arousal reveal the intensity of one's attitude toward an object, but not whether the attitude itself is positive or negative. On the physiological record, love and hate look very much the same. I like that. Okay, so I'm going to highlight that last sentence on the physiological record, or record. Um, Although behavior provides clues, the problem is that people monitor their overt behavior. Yeah, I think that's all we need to highlight in that. Although physiological arousal measures cannot distinguish between positive and negative attitudes, some interesting alternatives have been discovered. One is the face, facial electromyograph. EMG. Okay, that's another one. Shown in figure 6.2, certain muscles in the face contract when we're happy and different facial muscles contract when we are sad. Some of the muscular changes cannot be seen with the naked eye. However, the EMG cannot be seen, however, so the facial EMG is used. To determine whether the EMG can be used to measure the effect, affect associated with attitudes, John Cacchiopo, I think, and Richard Petty in 1981 recorded facial muscle activity of college students as they listened to a measure as, a, sorry, I'm being distracted. <laughs> I just need to put it down and stop playing with it. Okay. <sighs> to determine whether the EMG can be used to measure the effect, as affect associated with attitudes, John Kia, the researchers in 1981 recorded facial muscle activity of college students as they listened to a message with which they agreed or disagreed. The agreeable message increased activity in the cheek muscles, the facial pattern, that is characteristic with happiness. The disagreeable message sparked activity in the forehead and brow area, the facial patterns that are associated with sadness and distress. Outside observers who later watched the participants were unable to see these subtle changes. Apparently, the muscles in the human face reveal smiles, frowns, feelings of disgust, disgust and other reactions to attitude objects that might otherwise be hidden from view. So I'm going to highlight that last one. Apparently, from then on. From a social neuroscience, neuroscience perspective, electrical activity in the brain may also assist in the measure of attitudes. In 1929, Hans Berger invented a machine that could detect, amplify, and record waves of electrical activity in the brain using electrodes pasted to the surface of the scalp. This instrument was called an electroencephalograph, or an EEG. I don't know why that's not a term. That's major. Machine that could detect. And the inf 
information. Okay, so Hans Berger invented a machine that could detect, amplify, and record waves of electrical activity in the brain using electrodes pasted to the surface of the scalp. This instrument is called an electroencephalograph or an EEG. And the information it provides takes the form of line tracings called brain waves. Based on earlier based on an earlier discovery that certain patterns of electrical brain activity are triggered by exposure to stimuli that are novel or unexpected, that same researcher and others, um, the Italian name, the Cacchiopo, in 1993, had participants list 10 items they liked and 10 they did not like within various object categories, fruits, sports, movies, universities, etc. Later, these participants were brought into the laboratory, wired to an EEG, and presented with a list of category words that depicted objects they liked and disliked. The result, brainwave patterns that are normally triggered by inconsistency increased more when a disliked stimulus appeared after a string of positive items, or when a liked stimulus was shown after a string of negative items, then when either stimulus invoked the same attitude as the items that preceded it. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know if we need to highlight any of that. Yeah, I don't think so. Today, social psychologists are also starting to use new forms of brain imaging in the measurement of attitudes. In one study, researchers used fMRI to record brain activity in participants as they read names of famous and infamous figures, such as John F. Kennedy, Bill Cosby, and Adolf Hitler. When the names were read, they observed in participants greater activity in the amygdala, a brain structure associated with emotion, regardless of whether or not the participants were asked, asked to evaluate the famous figures. Okay, so I'm going to highlight fMRI to record brain activity, observed participants had greater activity in the amygdala, whether or not they were asked to evaluate the figures. All right, in a study focused on political attitudes, other researchers used fMRI to record brain activity in opinionated men during a presidential election as they listened to positive and negative statements about their preferred candidate. Although brain areas associated with cognitive reasoning were unaffected during these presentations, activity increased in areas typically associated with emotion. These studies suggest that people react automatically to positive and negative attitude objects, and that these attitudes may be measurable by electrical activity. I'm going to highlight that last sentence. At this point, social neuroscientists are exploring the neural processes in the brain that accompany the formation and change of attitudes. In light of how important the social psychology of persuasion is for advertising, public health campaigns, law, politics, and international conflicts and diplomacy, this work, although still in its infancy and sometimes hard to interpret, offers a potentially exciting new direction for attitude researchers. Yeah, I don't think that needs to be highlighted. Okay, so they're going to go through the implicit association test, the IAT, which He's referred to in chapter five. Actually, I think he just mentioned it today in class. Um, so this whole section is just about this one test. It leads me to believe that there's probably going to be at least one question about it. So even if you don't memorize or take detailed notes just about this test, um, the AIT, I mean, then you need to at least be very well read on this. So read it deeply, um, make notes if you want to, but it's, it's gonna be critical that you properly study that. So we've gone through what? One, two, three, four, five, 
and the AIT is six, seven, eight. So we haven't really gone through a full 10 pages um, in an hour. I think it took me more time to set up than I originally anticipated. So I'm just, I'm going to make it up on a different day. Um, I don't think it'll take more than maybe five, 10 minutes to make up the difference, but at least I kind of know what I'm doing now so that next time I don't waste as much time in the beginning setting up this and myself for the notes because it's the beginning of a chapter. I have to set up all the notes. Um, yeah. And I kind of know what kind of pace I have to read at. So I'm just going to read through the implicit association test real fast and see how much we can get through in the next five minutes. All right. When it comes to covert measurement, one particularly interesting development is based on the notion that each of us has all sorts of implicit attitudes that we cannot self-report in questionnaires because we are not even aware of having these attitudes. To measure these unconscious attitudes, a number of indirect methods have been developed. The most popular is the implicit association test created by Anthony Greenwald, Mazarin Banaji, Brian Nosek, and others. As we saw in chapter five, the IAT measures the sheer speed in fractions of a second in which people associate pairs of concepts. To see how it works, visit the IAT website by logging onto Project Implicit. They have a website, Implicit, yeah. Or installing a free IAT app on your phone. On the first page, you will read that Implicit, Project Implicit investigates thoughts and feelings that exist outside the conscious awareness or conscious control. To take a test that measures your implicit racial attitudes, you go through a series of stages. First, you're asked to category categorize black or white faces as quickly as you can, for example, by pressing a left-hand key in response to a black face and a right-hand key for a white face. Next, you're asked to categorize a set of words, for example, by pressing a left-hand key for positive words, love, laughter, friend, and a right key for negative words, war, failure, evil. Once you become familiar with the categorization task, the test combines face, faces and words. You may be asked, for example, to press the left-hand key if you see a black face or positive word and a right-hand key for white face or negative word. Then in the fourth stage, the opposite pairings are presented, black or negative, white or positive. Black and white faces are then interspersed in a quick sequence of trials, each time paired with a positive or negative word. In rapid fire succession, you have to press one key or another in response to stimulus pairs, such as black wonderful, black failure, white love, black laughter, white evil, white awful, black war, white joy. God, this sounds like a nightmare test to take. As you work through the list, you may find that some pairings are harder and take longer to respond to than others. In general, people are quicker to respond when liked faces are paired with positive words and disliked faces are paired with negative words than the other way around. Using the IAT, your implicit attitudes about African Americans can thus be detected by the speed it takes you to respond to black, bad, white, good pairings relative to black, bad, white, or black, good, white, bad pairings. The test takes only 10 to 15 minutes to complete. Once you're done, you receive the results of your test and an explanation of what it means. Why do I have a feeling he's gonna make us take this test? From 1998 to the present, visitors to the AIT website completed millions of tests in questionnaires, interviews, public opinion polls, internet surveys, people don't tend to express. Oh, and internet surveys. People don't tend to express stereotypes, prejudices, or other unpopular attitudes. Yet, on the IAT, respondents have inhibited a mark, exhibited a mark implicit preference for self over other, white over black, white skinned, light skinned over dark skinned, young over old, straight over gay, able over disabled, thin over obese, and the stereotype that links males with careers and females with family. Damn. 
That's rough. Okay, if the IAT measures unconscious thoughts that people do not self-report in questionnaires, does that mean that implicit attitudes are locked into place and never change? Does it mean that white public opinion polls show that people report greater tolerance today in the past than in the past regarding sexual orientation, for example, or obesity, that unconscious prejudice still lingers beneath the surface? Not necessarily. Analyzing 4.4 million US-based tests of implicit and explicit attitudes collected over a period of 10 years, Tessa Charlesworth and Mazarin Banaji in 2019 found that while people reported greater tolerance for obesity over time, IAT scores did not show a change in the preference for thin over obese. That's interesting. I'm going to highlight that. I'd recommend that you do too. I'm going to put that little wave over for the test or experiment or, or study done. Yet, when it comes to attitudes about sexual orientation, people not only reported 49% less negativity, negativity towards gays on explicit measures, but also exhibited 33% less straight over gay preference on the IAT. That's interesting. All right, figure 6.4 shows that just as explicit attitudes about sexual orientation changed dramatically over the course of a decade, implicit attitudes changed as well. Okay, so it is showing that there is change. That's good. I like that. All right. With more and more researchers using these kinds of indirect measures, social psychologists are debating what IAT scores mean. How the implicit attitudes revealed in the IAT are formed and then changed, how well these attitudes predict societally important behaviors, and how they differ from the more explicit attitudes that we consciously hold and report. In their best-selling book, Blind Spot, Hidden Biases of Good People, Banaji and Greenwald in 2013 provide an easy-to-read overview of this research and uh, controversies that surround it. I don't think that needs any highlighting. Do implicit attitudes matter? Do millisecond differences in response times on computerized tests really predict behavior in real world settings of consequence? And what does it mean when one's implicit and explicit attitudes clash? The importance of these questions cannot be overstated. If the IAT reveals unconscious prejudices that people do not self-report, should individuals be scrutinized in the laboratory for hidden motives underlying potentially unlawful behaviors, as when a police officer shoots a black suspect, fearing that he or she is armed, or when an employer hires a male applicant over a female applicant, citing his credentials as opposed to an act of discrimination, or as when a jury chooses to convict a Latino defendant on the basis of ambiguous evidence that we talked about in the last chapter. Eager to use the IAT for predicting social behaviors of consequence, some researchers have speculated about the relevance of implicit attitudes in the domains of law, politics, and mental health. But is their speculation justified? Some researchers are critical of claims concerning the predictive validity of AIT. I'm going to highlight that. That sounds pretty critical. Citing the need for more and stronger behavioral evidence. Based on a meta-analysis of 122 IAT studies involving 15,000 participants, Grunwald and others in 2009, conceded that people's implicit attitudes are generally less predictive of behavior than explicit attitudes. I'm also going to highlight that. That is critical. Or not highlight, I'm gonna make the little notation of a study done that might be important. They also have found, however, that IAT measures are better when it comes to socially sensitive topics for which people often conceal or distort their self-reports. In a poignant illustration of this point, one research team administered to a large group of psychiatric patients an IAT 
that measured their implicit associations between self and suicide. Over the next six months, patients appearing in the emergency room because of a suicide attempt had a stronger implicit association between self and suicide than those who appeared with other types of psychiatric emergencies. Interesting. All right, I'm gonna take a break. I need food. All right, um, thanks for going along and getting through about eight pages. Um, I think I'm going to pick up where we left off on my next video tomorrow um, and try to make up the difference now that I don't have to set everything up. Uh, if this is too much for you, I get it, but I have to study anyway, so if I have to slow down a little bit for the off chance that someone is getting something good out of this, then I'll continue. And um, even if there's just one person who uh, says this helps them, then I'll continue. And if not, then that's fine. I don't have to make them. But I just wanted to help and be able to have a study hall. Like I said, if you can ever make it to study hall on time, um, then you can always ask me questions. And if you cannot, feel free to send a message on GroupMe or text me. It doesn't make a difference to me. I'm happy to answer any questions over what I've gone over with you um, if you have them. I'm going to transfer some of these notes over since I was just highlighting frenzy in this one section <laughs> um, and just tried to power through it as fast as possible. See you next time, guys. Thanks so much for uh, joining me.